it is good to be back with you today. You know, there are some days when we need new truth. Uh, we need enlightenment on what's going on, what we need to know, what we need to do. And then there are days when we need to be reminded of truths that maybe have grown a little dim. We, we've not thought about them in a while, and we just need a refresher course. Today is a refresher. Now, your pastor is great at preaching God's truth to you week in and week out. And, and today I want to remind us of some of those things that, that we need to know. So I want you to turn to three Bible passages. All right. The first one is in Philippians chapter 4. And then Joshua chapter 1. Philippians is back there toward the end of the Bible, uh, close to Revelation. Keep turning back to the left and you'll find it there. And uh, Joshua is close to the front. And then one other, that's Matthew 28. Now this one you probably got memorized or at least you know it pretty well. So if you've only got two fingers to hold things, there you go. All right. So Philippians 4, Joshua 1, and Matthew 28. Just a minute ago, you saw that state missions offering, and I want to say that about 30000 of that comes back to Tarrant Baptist Association. It helps us do what we do related to church starting. We have a year-round residency for those who are starting churches, and that residency helps them learn the nuts and bolts of what it takes to lead a church. To, to launch a church successfully. Uh, so that money that comes back to Tarrant Association helps us do that. It also helps us with our Safe Baby Sleep Initiative. A number of years ago, uh, many of the professionals in our community realized that Tarrant County had the number one uh, rate of death for children before they turned one year old in the state of Texas. Now, friends, that just should not be. And so there are 40 agencies now that work together, the Safe Baby Sleep Council, and through the work that we've done with these agencies, and we've spent over $100,000 here in Tarrant County, uh, just through our association, to provide uh, a safe place for babies to sleep, that number of infant mortality, that infant mortality rate has significantly declined. Thank you for what you're doing to make a difference uh, for real lives. Thank you. Now, Philippians 4, 6 and 7 is one of those texts that we all love. In fact, if you're ever going to memorize the whole book of the Bible, let it be the book of Philippians. I mean, it's just a whole lot of fun, isn't it? My wife started memorizing it years ago. I'm sorry she's not here. I could put her on the spot and see, see how much she remembers. She would not let me uh, ride in the same car home with her if I did that. But, you know, it would be a lot of fun for me for a moment. But we're going to look at Philippians chapter 4, beginning with verse 4. It says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Now, remember that song we used to sing? I mean, some of you my age, uh, or about my age, you remember that song from vacation, Bible school, camp, Sunday school. Rejoice in the Lord always. There we go. You know it. And I'm not going to torture you anymore with my singing, but, you know, we just keep going. And we could do it in rounds. We could get this group doing it and this group doing it. This group. It would be so much fun. But maybe later. Maybe later. But rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Oh, the characteristics of our walk with God ought to be joy. A double dog dare you sometime to go back and look at Luke chapter 9 and Luke chapter 10. In chapter 9, Jesus sends out the 12, two by two. In chapter 10, he sends out the 72, the same way. And when they come back, they are rejoicing. And Jesus rejoices with them. If you want to know where joy in the Christian life comes from, it comes from walking with Jesus serving others in Jesus' name. The more we know him, the better we want to share him, and the more we do that, the more we experience his joy. But we haven't gotten to the text yet. So, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. 
rejoice. Let your graciousness be known to everyone. Now, guys, I want you to pay real close attention to here. This is what we ought to be known by. If you see Christians in the news today, it's probably going to be bad, right? Uh, but let's change the story. He tells us how to do that. Let your graciousness be evident to all. He says, the Lord is near. He says, don't worry about anything. But in everything, through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Don't you love those verses? I love reading through the Bible each year. I've been doing it for a number of years. And each year I read through a different translation. This year I'm reading through the New Living Translation. And I love Philippians 4, 6, and 7 in the New Living Translation. It says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all He's done. Isn't that great? Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. What does He say? Turn your worries into prayers. Now, some of us are professional worry warts. Isn't that right? I had a good friend named Molly Weiss. Molly, uh, when my wife and I moved to Nocona, Texas, where I was a pastor at the First Baptist Church, Molly was 89 years old. She was a retired school teacher. Uh, she had uh, been married as a young woman. And they had a, a, a beautiful daughter who also became a school teacher and who also is now retired. Uh, but Molly's husband passed away just a few years after... Uh, after they were married. Molly never remarried. She and my wife share the same birthday, April 12th. And they loved each other as if they were uh, you know, just best friends, closest in age. They were decades apart, but they saw just about everything the same way, except that Molly was the best worry wart I've ever met in my whole life. And I talked to her about that. I counseled her about that. I, I encouraged her about that. I taught her this verse. And she was still a worry ward. Some of us have turned pro when it comes to worrying. And let's just be honest. Some of us don't worry about anything, and we probably should. Isn't that right? But Molly was a world-class worry ward. Well, wherever you are on the scale, I never worry about anything or I worry about everything, or somewhere in between, wherever you are on the scale, the next time you start worrying about something, turn it into a prayer instead. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Now, the Apostle Paul is also the, who wrote this. is the same guy who said, pray without ceasing. For those of you who are worry warts, you know how this works now. And for the rest of us, we need to turn everything into prayer. I was driving down the road this morning, and there was a guy who was driving way too slow, and there was also a guy driving way too fast, and I got in between them. Now, brothers, if you're going to worry while you're in the car, sisters, if you're going to be concerned, that's the time. Because these two guys were trying to you know, work it out on the highway. And I was in between them. So, yeah, that's a good time to pray. I find that praying in my car is one of the most natural things in the whole wide world to do. Have you noticed that people will tell you how to pray for them on their car? I mean, think about it. Some of them have the University of Texas Longhorns on their car. You know you need to pray for them. If you have relatives who, who attended Baylor University, listen, you need to be praying for them today, all right? Just, just saying. Not going to talk any more about football because we'll get to my team and I don't want to talk about that, all right? But there are things people put on their cars, they're the way people drive, that, that will teach you how to pray, what you ought to pray. Pray don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need. 
Now, that's a great word, need. It's a whole lot more than desire. It's, a, it's very different from uh, just what I want. But what do I really need? Jesus taught us to pray, give us today our daily bread. He said, let's not get ahead of God's. Let's not fall behind God. Let's trust God to provide what we need when we need it. And if you go back to those texts from Luke, I was talking about just a minute ago, Luke 9, Luke 10, you'll discover in both of those chapters as Jesus is sending out those folks, where he guides, he provides. He said, you have what you need. Don't take a whole bunch of extra supplies. Just go, trust me, I'll take care of you. Where God guides, God provides. So what do you need today? Let's be honest with God about that. Tell him what you need. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he's done. Why thank him? Because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. The, the God of Moses is the God of King David. Is the, is the same God of the Apostle Paul and the same God of us. Thank him for all he's done. Now, Early on, people impressed on me that I needed to write all my prayer requests. Well, that's a pretty long list. And, and finally, I came to the place where I was doing listless praying, you know. I couldn't write everything down. But it's good to write some things down because every now and then there's a prayer request that you know is going to take more time than just today. Every now and then I pray about something that I think is so incredibly hard. I don't know how God is ever going to do it. And he does it so quickly that it makes my head swim. And then there are those times when I wonder if he's ever going to say yes. And I know it's something he wants to say yes to because he's made it clear in the Bible. Listen, God doesn't settle things on our timeline. He is working out things in a way that you and I cannot see or perceive. We will never know this side of heaven. But we do not give up in prayer because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he loves our loved ones more than we do. He loves the nations more than we do. He has planned for all of those people and all of those things is better than we could ever imagine. But we continue to go to him in prayer, seeking his highest and best and volunteering to be whatever part of the answer he wants us to be. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for what he's done. When you write down your prayers and you see God answer, anytime you get discouraged, anytime you get concerned that he's not going to answer this time, go back. And remind yourself all the ways he has said yes in the past. And let that encourage your heart. You know, I want us to turn to Joshua chapter 1, verse uh, chapter 1 right now. I, I want us to look at something. Here's the thing. You've heard this said before, uh, that we should not be afraid because God is in charge. We should not... Fear because God is here. God is near. The Apostle Paul just said that in Philippians 4. Jesus is near. The Lord is near. In fact, you have never been out of his presence. There's never been a moment where you were someplace that he was not. I just need you to understand that. You have never been out of his care. This side of heaven, you're never going to be. Uh, so one of the things we've been told is that we're not to fear. Remember a number of years ago, some of you remember this, there were fear not t-shirts and bumper stickers. And then there was the, the uh, Texas version, ain't scared. We don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be afraid. In fact, in fact somebody has counted up and it says the Bible says 366 times in one form or another, don't be afraid or stop being afraid. Now that's one for every day of the year plus leap year. Think about that. Don't be afraid. How can we live a life without fear? Joshua 1 tells us how to do it. Now I want us to look at this uh, in, uh, beginning with verse 1. I want you to notice what's going on here. Let's set the context. And it says, after the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, 
The Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant. Moses, my servant, is dead. Stop. Who's Moses? Well, he's that guy who grew up as a prince of Egypt. And then he decided to do God's will his way and kill the guy and then had to live a life on the run for the next 40 years. And that's when God got ready to deliver his people. He met Moses there in his hiding place and called him and for two chapters had to convince him and then God was just showing off. He said, I've already got sent your brother, he's already on the way, so I already set this whole thing up for you. But Moses, the only leader those people had known for 40 years. And even though Joshua had been there with Moses and had been commissioned by Moses, current reality is Moses is dead. That part of the story is over. There's a new story, and you're going to have to take the lead. And so what does God say to him? He says, now you and all the people prepare to cross over the Jordan to the land I'm giving the Israelites. I have given you every place where the sole of your foot treads, just as I promised Moses. The promises God makes, he keeps, even beyond our lifetime. I was talking with a man who's 82 years old a month or so ago, and he's written a number of books. He's got his life plan out to age 90, and then he's got a plan for how his books will be used to minister God's grace to folks for the next hundred years. Dude, that's pretty good planning right there. We need to understand that God can use our lives better than we can, even after we're gone. And he says, I'll give you uh, this place, everywhere your foot treads, just as I promised Moses. Your territory will be from the wilderness and Lebanon to the great river, the Euphrates River, all the land of the Hittites and west to the Mediterranean Sea. No one will be able to stand against you as long as you live. Here's the part that ought to catch our attention. I will be with you as I was with Moses. Everybody who knew Moses knew it wasn't Moses doing all that stuff. It wasn't Moses saying all those things. It was God using Moses to communicate his truth, his leadership through him. As I will be with you just as I was with Moses... I will not leave you or abandon you. I would love for somebody, and somebody probably has, and I just haven't found it yet. I would love to have somebody count up all the times in the Bible where God tells us, I will never leave you or forsake you. I will never abandon you. You are never alone. But let's just count on this text today to remind us we are never alone. Oh, let me go ahead and spoil it. Matthew 28, 20. What does, what's the last thing Jesus says there? I will be with you to the very end of the age. You will never be alone if you belong to him. You ever felt all alone? You ever felt forsaken? You ever felt absolutely terrified by your circumstances? I just need you to know you have never been alone. And you never will be if you know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. He said, I will be with you. I will never leave you. I will never abandon you. And then you get to verse 8. He says, or verse 6, be strong and courageous, for you will distribute the land I swore to their ancestors and gave them as an inheritance. Verse 7, above all, be strong and very courageous. And you've got verses 7 and 8. Verse 8 is one of those verses you ought to commit to memory. It's really good stuff. But then it comes to verse 9. And he says, haven't I commanded you? He's, he doesn't make this an option to Joshua. He doesn't make it an option for you and me either. Haven't I commanded you? Be strong and courageous. 
If you go back to Deuteronomy and read through there, after the commissioning of Joshua, you will see God say to him several times in the book of Deuteronomy, be strong and courageous. Here he says it three different times, be strong and courageous. Be strong and very courageous. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous? Courage is not an option. If you know Jesus is with you, if you know Jesus is leading you, if Jesus is in charge, you don't have to be afraid of anything. I'll never forget the day I told my grandmother when I was six years old, uh, eight years old, I'll never forget when I told her, I ain't scared of nothing. And she said, nothing? I said, nothing. She said, I bet you are. I said, I bet I'm not. She said, what about snakes? Well, she had me there. In fact, I was with a guy this week, seminary professor, wise, uh, just a great guy, great heart for God. Uh, he was a general in the army. I mean, this guy, if anybody has learned to not be scared of nothing, it's him. And I had him and the other guys at the retreat we were leading go out and uh, uh, find some walking sticks. We gave them axes and saws and stuff to go create walking sticks. And he came back and reported, he said, there are three things I'm afraid of. Live snakes, dead snakes, and sna uh, sticks that look like snakes. <laughs> Army general, man of God. All of us have those things we're naturally afraid of. All of those things, all of us have those things that that cause our hearts to be a little faster. Well, God has told us, when you're on mission for me, when you are walking with me, when you understand that I am here, I am with you now and always, you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to fear. Now, I've memorized verse 9 from the New New International Version, and the 1984 version uh, uh, of the New uh, International Version says, Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous, do not be terrified, do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. Listen, the worst thing that could happen to us is the best thing that will ever happen to us. If we lose our lives, we will be in Jesus' presence immediately. And friends, it just doesn't get any better than that. Uh, the, do you understand that tears are bound in time? We are destined for a tearless eternity. We, are, uh, we experience joy in measure. It is unmeasured in heaven. It's the natural state of being. Our Father in heaven is the most joyful being in the universe. And the closer we get to him, the more joy we experience. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. Remember that old movie? Um, comes on at Christmas all the time. A Wonderful Life. Now, some people are Wonderful Life people. It's a Wonderful Life people. And some of that other movie, uh, the one with the leg lamp, you know that one? Uh, and I'm... I'm not going to do a poll here this morning. I just want you to know one is of God and the other one's not. All right, just saying. All right. Uh, some of you don't know what I'm talking about, so move on, move on. Remember in that It's a Wonderful Life, a couple of angels are talking in heaven about this guy down on earth. He says, is he sick? No, worse. He's discouraged. Ever been discouraged? You don't have to raise your hand. You have have been. But some of us are discouraged today. And, and God says to us, we don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be discouraged. For the Lord our God is with us. He is with us. God is with you wherever you go, it says. And that is as up to date as the risen Jesus telling those disciples, I will be with you always. And on that day of ascension, after those 40 days where Jesus appeared to as many as 500 people at a time, when he ascended into heaven there in Acts chapter 1, when the Spirit came in Acts chapter 2, we can have that confidence that he is with us always. 
to remove the fear, to give us courage, to give us hope, to give us life, to give us whatever we need for whatever we face. My friends, those are thoughts worth remembering. Those are things that we need to call to mind. Here are some Bible verses worth committing to memory. So the next time we're discouraged, we know how to pray. The next time we are afraid, we know how to pray. And the first part of that prayer is, because you are with me, I don't have to be afraid. I can trust you to provide. I can trust you to guide. I can trust you to lead me from where I am to where I need to be. I can trust you that no matter what happens, eventually everything is going to be right. Who needed that reminder today? For somebody, that might sound like brand new news. It may sound too good to be true, but it is the gospel truth. If you know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be discouraged. You'll never be in want. He will guide and provide. He will take care of you. Now, if you've never met Jesus as Savior and Lord, we're going to give you that opportunity here in just a few moments. Uh, it's what we call the invitation. The invitation is to receive his gift, not only of eternal life, but a life full of meaning here and now. A life where you can depend on him to work in your behalf. Bad things do happen. People do stupid things, including us. The consequences can be unpleasant, but he can take even the worst things that happen to us and turn them into the best kind of ministry to others. If you've not met Jesus, come meet him today. If you've got something that is so big and fearful and awful in your life that you don't know how to live with it, come and pray. If you are struggling with something that only God can take care of, he is ready to take care of you. Would you come? Take your pastor by the hand and tell him what's going on. If you need Jesus, just say, I need Jesus. If there's a prayer concern, tell him what it is. How do you need to respond to what God's word is telling us today? Bow with me as we pray. Our Father, I thank you that because you are here and you are real, we don't have to be afraid. And because you are good, and you seek our highest and best. We don't have to be worried. And because you have prepared a place in heaven for us, the worst thing that could ever happen to us here is going to be the best thing that will ever happen. Father, we don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be discouraged. We can look up with hope today. We can overflow with joy. So, do what you need to do in us to bring us to the place where we overflow with joy. We pray together in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. As we sing this hymn of invitation, your pastor will be here. You come, take him by the hand, and tell him the decision you need to make.